Good afternoon. My topic for this convention is transparency in medical disclosure, particularly answering the question, how much does the patient or his family need to know? Now allow me to share my screen with you. Okay, so let's, let's look over a few scenarios um, to start our discussion. Now, this is a 30-year-old healthy female who underwent elective myomectomy. Appropriate preoperative evaluation was done and informed consent was taken. Induction of spinal anesthesia was uneventful. However, 30 minutes after the induction, the surgeon noticed upon cutting that the blood was dark and sluggish. A vital check revealed that the patient had barely palpable, palpable BP and was bradycardic. The patient was stabilized and the surgery proceeded. Postoperatively, the patient never woke up. She spent months at the hospital until she was eventually discharged in a vegetative state. Now, this is a case of a four-year-old male who underwent tonsillectomy under general anesthesia. Induction was uneventful and the patient was then positioned and prepped. 15 minutes after cutting, the anesthesiologist noted bradycardia and gave appropriate doses of atropine and epinephrine. The surgery was aborted. The patient had seizures of the PACU and was eventually discharged home with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Next on our list, is a 24-year-old healthy female who underwent emergency gyne lap under general anesthesia. Towards the end of the procedure, she was noted to be tachycardic and had increased end tidal CO2. Eventually, the patient arrested and died on the table. And lastly, this was the patient who underwent a 70-year-old patient who underwent elective tracheostomy prior to discharge. The procedure was uneventful and done under general anesthesia. However, after transferring from the OR table to the transport stretcher, the patient was noted to have desaturated and became unstable. After stabilization, she was brought back to the PACU and was eventually diagnosed with hypoxic encephalopathy. She eventually expired after a four month stay at the hospital. So what do these scenarios have in common? What do they say? These are adverse events, obviously, particularly sentinel events. Before we discuss disclosure, we would need to define first what these events are. So, Adverse events have been defined by different institutions. Medical harm actually has existed since antiquity, famously discussed by Hippocrates and passed on in the word iatrogenesis, from the Greek for originating from the physician. Now, adverse event has been defined by the Harvard Medical Practice Study as an injury that was caused by medical management Rather, the underlying disease and that prolonged the hospitalization produced a disability at the time of discharge or both. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement defines adverse events as unintended physical injury resulting from or contributed to by medical care, including the absence of indicated medical treatment that requires additional monitoring, treatment, or hospitalization, or that results in death. Adverse events have various sub subcategories. First on the list are preventable adverse events. So these are events that are avoidable by means currently available unless that means was not considered standard of care. Preventable adverse events are defined as care that fell below the standard expected of physicians in their community. Next are ameliorable adverse events. So these are events that are not preventable, but the severity of the injuries 
could have been substantially reduced if different actions or procedures had been performed or followed. Lastly, there are also adverse events due to negligence. In most cases, these are intentional acts that fall below the standard of care that is required of us as physicians and as anesthesiologists. It is also important to note two other terms that define hazards to patients, but do not result in harm. Errors are a broader term referring to an act of omission or commission that exposes patients to potentially hazardous situations. A near miss, on the other hand, is an unsafe situation that is indistinguishable from a preventable adverse event, except for its outcome. So a patient is exposed to a hazardous situation but, but does not experience harm, either through luck or early detection. It is also called close calls or potential adverse events. Now last on the definition is a another type of adverse event, which is a sentinel event. And a sentinel event is an unexpected incident involving death or serious physical or psychological injury or the risk thereof. Now, knowing all these different uh, types of events, the question that is relevant to our topic today is, should you disclose adverse events? Traditionally, the response when an unexpected harm happens is to deny and defend, which is what a lot of lawyers would probably recommend or advise. But my question is, especially for us in the medical field and knowing what we know, if the adverse event had happened to you or your loved one, would you want to be informed? I am sure that the answer would be a resounding yes. We cannot therefore hold double standards, a different set of standards for us and a different set of standards for our patients. Now, we also need to define what disclosure is. So disclosure is a process by which harm from healthcare delivery is communicated to the patient or the patient's family or both. It is a process, again. It is not an isolated event. It does not happen just one time, since there are many, many points at which disclosure conversations can occur. The earlier the disclosure is made, the better. Ideally, as soon as the event had been identified, disclosure should be made since this will set the stage for future communication. It would encourage trust on the part of uh, the patient. With disclosure, patients are more inclined to consider the litigation of medical errors if their physicians did not disclose them. So while physicians recognize and acknowledge that disclosure of medical errors as a fundament, is a fundamental part of patient care, disclosure remains fluctuant. Barriers to disclosure in, include fear of litigation, repercussions of discussion with fears, with, with, with peers, I'm sorry, such as blame, embarrassment, or loss of reputation. Now, one article discusses what disclosure should include. So disclosure discusses what happened to the patient, it acknowledges the occurrence of an error, and it describes the link between the error and outcomes in a manner that is meaningful to the patient. There are various questions, but generally, disclosure communication should answer the following questions. First, what exactly happened? Next, what are the implications of the event for the patient's health? Why did that event happen? How will the organization prevent the adverse event from happening to another patient in the future? And lastly, who will shoulder the extra expenses because of the adverse event? Now, these questions cannot be answered by just one person. It is best that there is already a system in place in the institutions 
so that disclosure happens at the same time as the investigation and analysis of the event. Now, knowing all that, how much should you actually disclose? So this is the most relevant question probably to my topic, but this is also where it gets tricky because I can tell you that, you know, you should probably disclose everything that uh, you, you know, because my question to you again will be, if it were you, how much would you want to know? So how much to disclose may be, may be affected by a couple of factors. First, legally, and second, ethically. Now in the Philippines, legally, there is no specific law requiring disclosure of adverse events in healthcare. Concealment is usually detrimental and can lead to liability for damages because there are ways that a patient can bring a doctor or an institution to court. But it, and it also must be kept in mind that errors and mistakes do not necessarily stay hidden and concealment often results in compromising the healthcare team members as well as the institution. Now the mission of healthcare organizations is to provide for proper and safe patient care. And, and this mission gives them an ethical obligation to admit clinical mistakes, professional and organizational policies, risk management, patient safety, and performance improvements demand prompt reporting, investigation, and disclosure. As physicians, we have a professional, moral, and ethical obligation to our patients. Legal self-interest and vulnerability must be tempered by the principle of fidelity. By our oath, which we took when we passed the physician's licensure exam, we do not disclose, when we do not disclose errors or adverse events, we actually violate the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence. So it is so easy for me to say that, you know, disclosure should be complete and thorough because that is what I would expect if an adverse event had happened to me. And it is easy to do when we know that one, we did everything within the required standard of care. Two, when we know that we did right by our patients. Three, when we know that we adhere to patient safety principles. And lastly, when we know that we have nurtured the physician-patient relationship. Now let us go back to the previous scenarios present presented at the start of this case. Now that 30 year old female who underwent elective myomectomy, in this event, the anesthesiologist was actually attending to two patients. He gave a spinal anesthesia to this patient first and then left to give an, an anesthetic to another patient in the adjoining OR, leaving no one to properly look after this patient. So what type of adverse event is this? Is it actually just an, an adverse event or is it one that is due to negligence. Now this four year old boy who underwent tonsillectomy, there were possible contributing events to the development of bradycardia and uh, the development of cerebral palsy. First, this is, the positioning was done by the surgical service, although the patient had a precordial set in place allowing the anesthesiologist to monitor the tube placement. However, the endotracheal tube could still have been slightly dislodged. Also, a few minutes prior to cutting, the surgeon had injected local anesthesia lidocaine into the operative site, which could have been a factor in the development of bradycardia, unstable vital signs, and eventually hypoxic NCEF leading to cerebral palsy. Now this patient who underwent gyne lap, the clinical presentation was actually compatible with CO2 embolism or malignant hyperthermia. 
However, in this case, no one went to the family and explained to them what actually happened to the patient, prompting them to bring the case to court. And lastly, the patient who underwent elective tracheostomy, the transfer to the stretcher was actually done by residents, since the consultant, both the surgeon and the anesthesiologist had already left the OR room prior to this transfer. And at that time when the patient desaturated, the surgical resident was not confident enough to check the placement of the trach tube. It was later discovered that the tube had displaced, most likely during the transfer from the OR table to the stretcher. Now, these scenarios show different types of adverse events. There is one that was due to negligence. There, are, there is one that is ameliorable. There is one that um, was probably most likely not preventable. And in these sample cases, the, the ease of disclosing would differ depending on the backstory. Now, as I mentioned, there is no law requiring disclosure in the Philippines. There is actually no universal hard and fast rule as to what or how much to disclose. If anything, we probably just have the golden rule, which says that do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. As I mentioned earlier, we could not have, we cannot have double standards separate for ourselves and for our patients. I'm sure I leave you with more questions than answers. But the short of it is, if you ask me how much to disclose to the patient, then we should disclose fully and completely, but we should also be able to disclose appropriately. Thank you very much and have a good day.